this is the weekend early show and i have an esteemed guest in studio and you know uh we've actually just uh we're just talking about uh, quite a few things and uh, one of them happens to be uh you know one of the things that's always a topic of conversation in the news is the fact that there's always uh, ongoing conflict and one that seems to be the forgotten conflict but our next guest has certainly highlighted this in his uh, dissertation uh, he actually just recently obtained his doctorate. Uh, this is from UWC. And I am very honored to have a Dr. Jacob Kate in studio to discuss the politics of belonging and the contest for survival. And uh, it's such an honor to have you in studio. And of course, congratulations on your PhD. Uh, thank you for joining us on Weekend Early. Thank you, Mpo. And uh, you know, your dissertation, uh, it's uh, quite fascinating. It extensively explores and examines the politics of belonging with regards to the ongoing conflict in North and South Kivu in the Eastern region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. So what inspired this as the chosen thesis? And did you always possess a passion for politics? So uh, I don't know how long I have um, to answer this question, but to be brief, uh, I was deployed in, 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 in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in 2004 until April uh, 2005. And during that time, um, I was a peacekeeper part of the SANDF. So the one thing, if, if you didn't travel outside of South Africa and, and, and you go to parts of Africa, then it's quite, it, it's quite new to you. So the one thing that struck me coming from South Africa is that the, the, the kind of hopelessness that I felt of the people in, 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 in that particular region. So the conflict really messed the kind of mess with my, with my thinking. And, and in South Africa, we struggle with poverty, but the levels of violence and destitute that I saw there is the kind of things that, that stayed with me. So when I finally had to do my PhD, the one thing then that me and my supervisor got to is, um, apart from the South African kind of research interest, is there anything else on the African continent that that, that you would like to he ask me. So I said to him, okay, let's do the conflict in the DRC because to me at that particular moment, the violence, so I saw it as senseless. Why would people kill each other in that particular way? So for me, it was kind of to get to an answer to a question that I had a long time ago. There was an article, an opinion piece penned by the Mail and Guardian some time back and they referred to this war as the forgotten war because usually when you think of ongoing uh, unrest, you think of Afghanistan, you think of Syria. So do you certainly agree that this is uh, the forgotten war? Definitely. Um, I think uh, there, there is, there is very statistics, that's out, but there's two, trouble, two troubling st statistics that is out there. So the one, the one estimate saying that since 1997, 1996, since the conflict um, break out, up until I think it was 2012, 5.3 million people died in the conflict. So the other estimate says that that statistical analysis is wrong. It's 2.8 million. Now, both of these incidences, the death toll is in millions. So you find that some scholars is arguing over the statistical analysis, but the one point that they're missing is that millions of people died in this conflict. Some of them is direct, meaning is direct by the ongoing conflict, and some of them is indirect, meaning is that it is the infrastructure, like dying of cholera, um, all of other related issues. So, so that's how they, how they calculate it. But the, the issue is millions of people died in that conflict, and it is forgotten. And the reason why it's forgotten is because uh, the DRC is mainly a French country. So what we might not get, especially who speak English and who's kind of an Anglophone country, is that we don't get the, the, the news reports that is in the French media. So one of so one of the reasons why and, and one of the reasons why I'm here, what I want to speak about it, is to kind of bring it into the kind of English mainstream so that we can start speaking about the conflict. Because there's volumes been written on the conflict in in Francophone countries, but not in Anglophone countries. So, this, so there is a number of, 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 of pioneering research in, 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 in English, but there's more being done in, in, in kind of, 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 of French. So in, 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 in French circles, it's like Francophone countries, but not in, in, in ours. So it's forgotten in the English media, but I don't think it's forgotten in, in French media. And, you know, bringing colonialism into this, 
Um, you know, I think one of the things that I certainly found quite interesting is that, um, you know, I think the, the focus of why this war is happening has been probably uh, a completely misguided one because, I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's uh, the, the colonial um, invasions that have also just had a hand in uh, molding the uh, different uh, ethnic groups now and also they're the ones that actually decided actually who would be considered indigenous and who is considered uh, not part of uh, being part of the, the DRC. So uh, what, what are your, your thoughts on that and uh, with regards to how it's also just either uh, compromised or taken the narrative in a whole completely different direction? The one thing if you look at the African continent, and this is, this, this is the big thing that a lot of us miss, is that the borders, when you study this, there's straight lines on the African, on the African map, there's straight lines. Now that map, that, that lines on, on that map is a result of the, the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885. So that particular conference led to an event which people call the Scramble for Africa. So the aim of that, uh, that one was to d determine the borders of the Congo Free State. So King Lo uh, Leopold, with the Belgian monarch, that acquired a whole, the, what, what we call now the DRC, as its own. And it's called, um, it was called the Congo Free State and later it was Belgium Congo. But, and, and the first kind of genocide was recorded in the Congo Free State, where millions of people died. But that's also another part that, that a lot of people doesn't speak about. So, to answer your question is that the, the colonialism, the big, the big legacy of colonialism is those lines on the African map. Because if you look at the conflict in, in the DRC, especially the eastern part of the DRC, where we find Rwanda and Burundi, and the DRC is drawing a line right through established communities. Almost like uh, in South Africa, when, with Zimbabwe in, 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 in South Africa, is that there's existing community so when you draw a line and you say that this is now South Africa and, and you guys that side is Zimbabwe then what needs to happen is two different types of identity that is formed the one is the Zimbabwean identity which is completely new because we have never seen ourselves as, uh, as Zimbabwe and, and, and in South Africa now suddenly we need to have a South African identity now the same thing happening in the DRC is that people on both sides had to apart from the ethnic identities that they have also you had to get national identity and colonialism gave more rights and privileges within citizenship so meaning is that you can access certain things when you from the DRC or you when you're Rwandan or you when you are from Burundi and that's the legacy that most of of, of the states post uh, post uh, post colonial Africa is kind of, of, of struggling with is Apart from the, the, the ethnic identities, also these national identities. But across the border, this family of mine, once we used to be part of the same community, but suddenly we're different um, nationality. What, what I find um, even sadder is that because it's an ongoing war, um, it's, it's even more challenging for uh, the narrative to be completely owned by the original inhabitants. So, you know, I think that's, that's certainly something that... Uh, that always needs to be ob observed and never forgotten. So, uh, yeah. the interesting part is, uh, is uh, the idea of the original inhabitants. So currently, um, in the end of my dissertation, I had to come to the conclusion that there's a, con a contested history in that part of Africa where some people see themselves as the original inhabitants and then say, uh, those of you, the other, is not the original inhabitants and then the other say but we are the original inhab inhabitants and you are not the in, 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 in original inhabitants for, for example a lot of people know about uh, the 1994 Rwandan genocide in the 1994 Rwandan genocide the Tutsi was killed um, millions of Tutsi was killed or not millions it's about 600,000 Tutsi was killed and 200,000 Hutu were killed in, 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 in Rwandan genocide but the reason why the Tutsi was killed is because colonial narratives said that they are foreigners coming from somewhere from the Horn of Africa that took over the, 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 the Bantu split, which was the Hutu. Yes. But after 1994, when the Tutsi kind, kind of got back into power, the narrative changed, the saying is that the Bantu 
came from West Africa that is also uh, a migrant to the particular area. So this area, we were the year before the, the, the Bantus. So we are the original inhabitants. So the idea of the original inhabitants is one of the most pro problematic discourses. And that is kind of at the basis or the foundation of this conflict, because then it kind of creates a belonging that I am the original inhabitant, so I can claim place to this particular one. So it's who is in, who is in control of the state can de determine the narrative of the original inhabitant. I mean, considering the nature of this, this is, it's never ending and it's ongoing and it's, it's, um, it's highly unlikely, I mean, at the moment that there will be some sort of conclusion, con uh, conclusion reached to favor all parties involved. And, you know, speaking of, of which, um, when, you know, with regards to what we were discussing and also uh, with your thesis. So uh, the write-up that was actually penned by uh, UWC Humanities faculty celebrating your doctorate uh, states that your thesis argues that the conflict should not be observed as singular, but rather as multiple, not as national, but uh, regional, and most centrally, uh, not as a resource-driven, but shaped by the reproduction of cultural identity. So could you kind of elaborate a bit more on that? Could you kindly just expand on, on that? So this is for people who is very familiar on the conflict, the terminology that they use, but I encourage people to actually go into go online and Google the conflict. So the issue when it comes to cultural identities is between the Banyar Malengi and the Banyar Rwanda. So the Banyar Rwanda means, if you break down the word, those from Rwanda, and the Banyar Malengi says those from Mulenge. So the ones from Mulenge is a village within the DRC. Now those those people originally was considered the, the Banyu Mulenge is originally considered migrants from Rwanda. The Banyu Rwanda is mostly Hutu or is perceived mostly Hutu. They came there during colonial times. And that's why they called Banyu Rwanda. So it means those from Rwanda. But the Banyu Mulenge, who was mainly Tutsi changed the narrative because at one point they were also referred to by Congolese as the Banya Rwanda. So they said, okay, but we are not from Rwanda. We are from Mulenge. And that's why they say Banya, it means from Mulenge. So we are from the, from the area around Mulenge. And this is the contested narrative. So mostly when people read the conflict, you come across the Banya Rwanda and the Banya Mulenge. But what a lot of people forget is about the Congolese that was with them during that particular time. So that's where you will find the Nande and you will find the Hunde. Those are groups in the Nyanga. They were there with the Banya Rwanda and sometimes before the Banya Rwanda and the Banya Mulenge. And this is where the, the, the narrative of the original inhabitants becomes the problematic one because someone has to leave. Also, you know, I feel that um, especially, you know, considering which leader comes into power, which party comes into power and what their agenda is, I feel that uh, with regards to the the contestation for this, the politics of belonging, that they also, in a way, are using this as fuel to keep that division in order to uh, keep uh, their, their power, their, just their, their, their power over that specific region. I mean, uh, would you agree with that? So, to a certain extent. Yeah. Because what in... The, Whoever is in power. So there's this multiple layers of it. So you have at the local level where there's a strong sense of that belong to this particular area. But from that, you need to get kind of elected at the local level, at the provincial level, and at the national level. So some of these elites, and this is where the context of survival comes in, they use these particular original narratives or these issues as a way of getting re-elected by pushing the other one out. So if you're in power, then you say, okay, is that I'm giving the people who elected me the resources and neglect the other group. So then the other group say, but we are neglected from this. So they contested for power up either in the municipal or in the provincial or at the national level. Mm -hmm. So if you get at the national level, then your group's agenda and you get the resources. now. In the DRC's case, it's two things that is really con where, where, where people benefit. is from agriculture, so that's farming, right. and mining. So 
the 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 citizenship in land is linked in the eastern part of the DRC. So there's various X. So if you're a citizen, you can you can get land. If you're not a citizen, a citizen, then you can get land. So at at the heart of this is that the people who get elected start manipulating local narratives and history mm. so that they get in power. So then it becomes this contest of survival between these groups because who's ever in power is going to give kind of resources and, 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 and land to the group that elected them into, into space. And if that doesn't work, then it's an armed contest. The other points I would also like to touch on, especially with the preparation of your thesis. So where did you actually, uh, where did you actually begin with this? And what were the challenges when it came to research? And how did you tackle those? The idea of that this is a conflict with regards to belonging is after I read um, several articles on the conflict, but I came across um, a more and more literature on Rwanda. So as I came across the literature of, of Rwanda, especially in 1994, when Tutsi leads took over the power in, in Rwanda, the Banyo Malenge didn't leave the DRC. There is a group of Tutsi that leave the DRC, and they were the recent migrants because of conflict, earlier conflict. So the conflict in that region started early in the independence. So it started in, it, it first started in Burundi, then it started in, no, it first started in Rwanda in 1959, and then it started in Burundi. So they, you have, in Burundi, the, the Hutu was in power. So, no, in Burundi, the Tutsi was in so power. power yes. So they pushed out the, the, the Hutu. In Rwanda, the, the Hutu was in power, and they, tu they pushed out the Tutsi. So, when the Tutsi got in power in Rwanda, a lot of the Tutsi of, the, of that particular group went back to, to Rwanda, but the Banyu Malengi stayed. Those people that was in the DRC at the particular time of King Lord Leopold, when they draw the, 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 the thing, is like, we are from Malengi, and they also see themselves as Tutsi, so they see themselves as Malengi, the DRC, they also see themselves as Tutsi, but they didn't leave. And this is the question is, that came to me is why didn't they leave? So then I realized for them it's an issue of belonging, but we belong here as much as any other group that was here during that particular time. So then I said this must be a politics of, of belonging. So from then onwards I started tackling it like that. So I started looking, is it other people who wrote on it? And I found there was a number of people who wrote on it, but there was no theoretical explanation of it. And, and this is what my dis dissertation does differently. I kind of extend it to a theoretical explanation, which you can kind of universally apply. So if you look at uh, xenophobia in South Africa, it's a politics of belonging. If you like, look at the, 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 the refugee crisis in, 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 in Europe, it's a politics of belonging. Brexit and even the issue of crime and anti-migrants and all of this is a politics of belonging because what I try to do, do in my research, uh, 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 especially in my, my dissertation, is to kind of look at the politics of belonging. Can we universally apply this to many other conflicts? And this is the, uh, this is the contribution that my dissertation makes. You can use that as a theoretical back, uh, backdrop to read other conflicts. So um, I understand that uh, you're also a, uh, a man of uh, many hats as well. Um, you know, you not only have done this, you also produced and directed a documentary called Bitter Suit, and also you are the producer of uh, two uh, uh, web two web series uh, on YouTube and uh, a hip hop themed one as well as a politically themed. So could could you tell us about um, your approach to just producing and creating this documentary, and uh, also just the the types of techniques that you employed whilst filming this? So Bitter Suit is about me. So. The people that you see there is, this is a part of me that, that for, for many years that I had to confront. And in this form, I'm trying to confront it. And the, one of the, 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 the final realization when I look at this form is like, this form is about me. Even though I'm not visually present in the form, right. but this form is about me. But it's also another way of thinking the post-apartheid. I personally believe that we didn't arrive at a post-apartheid yet. However, there is opportunities within marginalized communities 
outside the dominant kind of, of way of thinking the South African society, there is other ways of thinking these particular societies or, or, or South Africa. And what the suit is an attempt on them is how does rural people think? How do they live on a daily basis? Because when we think about the rural person, we always think it is someone that needs to be pity, that is backward, that doesn't have anything. That you from the outside have to come and rescue them, or they doesn't have. And 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 what this and what this form does is to show that there's a lot of agency. There's a lot of they are they are proud. They are proud of who they are, and and they don't ask any anyone for something because they are them, unapologetically. And that is what I try to do with Batusu, is that you cannot change their reality, whether you want it or not, mm. whether you feel pity for them, they don't. They unapologetically are proud who they are. And I must say, um, that's exactly what I, I took away from it after I had watched that. And I, I must say, I was so I was very pleasantly um, entertained, especially by uh, the dance, the dancing as well. And that just just that that I, I just love how they they also try and immerse, immerse the youth into that just that culture as well. Uh, just uh, having a strong sense of pride of where they're from, so that's what I also particularly uh, just just loved about that as well. And it's it's a community that works together, close knit, uh, very neighbourly, and yes, having having that pride of of knowing of knowing where you are from and how important it is in shaping your identity. I just want to say um, something about dance. But this is, is 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 about the real dance. Yes, but the real dance is one of those marginalised dances within South African culture. So. But within the real dance, I've discovered there's a whole history. It's an archive of stories. So there's different regions that will use this dance to tell their story. In Butterfontein, where this form is, that is their way of telling their story. So all of the symbolism and all of the things that they show in this dance is happening. It's their archive. So. Even during apartheid, when this dance was uh, considered backward, these communities used these dance to archive their stories. And now they have opportunity to kind of tell this particular story of them. And they can tell it unap unapologetically. So there's other ways, and, th and th this is what I'm trying to say, is that if we go into these communities, we must not go as saviors. When we go into rural communities, when we go into, I hate this word, township, I don't, I, it's, it's a creation, I, I, I hate yeah, it. I, I, I'm there with you, that's, yes. But if we go into these spaces, we must not go as saviors. We must go as people to go and learn. Because once you learn, I go, when I normally make a form, I, I tell people, is that I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn about your experience and how you see this. I'm no expert. So once you open yourself to learning, then the experience is so much so much more that you can get you you gain so much more from that much more enriching as well because i mean especially now that now that you're talking about that and um having that uh you know it's it's also and i know sometimes people uh, try and you know um visit certain communities with the well and with a, with that intention of you know um wanting to bring more and invest more into it but uh, also having that uh, savior complex as well could be quite damaging and also it's it's um i think people who especially people um who are proud of their community such as in bitter suit may even find that offensive because it could also uh, unintentionally create some form of othering by you as a visitor having this savior complex and now you're not there to learn and to to understand um the culture to understand uh you know the history of 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 this town the people and the, the sense of pride that they carry on a daily basis in the different spaces that they occupy within this town it's almost like it's a self-serving agenda in a sense so I, I i certainly agree with what she said but after watching um but this would, and you see how um hendrik no, yes no, negotiate then the question would be is um who am i what do i do where do where do I fit? Because this p particular person is a normal person. But if you go and you see him, Hendrik, and you see him with pity, then you will m miss a, the complete story of him. He is really able in doing all of the things. I don't want to give a lot of 
a lot away. Yes, no, of course. Please, yeah, do watch. Yes, we know no spoiler alerts here. I know I also get carried away, so I'll just I'll end off that question, <laughs> that that answer by saying please do have a uh, a look at it on on YouTube. It is available and it is called Bitter Suit. Um, I I promise you, you will thoroughly enjoy this immensely as well. You'll learn so much more about the people from this wonderful town. And uh, I do have to round off the conversation. It has been incredibly educational and and fascinating. The your findings and also your uh, theoretical and unique approaches to um, just analyzing conflict and also uh, the resolutions that can um, that that can actually be reached after you know observing observing this with your um, approach uh, how what I'm, I'm just uh, rounding off for of this uh, question uh, what would you want our listeners to walk away with and where can they actually find your dissertation uh, before I get into the dissertation um, I want our listeners to know about the all of us contribute to conflict in the DRC. There is rare min minerals that is taking place that, that is mined illegally in that part of, of, of the world. So every time you buy a smartphone, then you contribute to the conflict. So all of us, we have smartphones that have blood in our hands. I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Because the minerals that we use in our smartphones is cassettrite and cobalt. In most of those cases, Children is being forcefully used to mine those with no wages. So it's literally slave labor. So if you have one phone, it's fine. But if you have three or four of these phones, start thinking about if you buy every time Apple or some of this, then more and more cassetterite needs to. Now, the thing is, the smartphones are coming cheaper because the labor is cheaper. Because the cassetterite is actually a really expensive material. So if, if, if the smartphone is cheaper, then you get the minerals cheaper, meaning there is no labor cost on this. So we need to think twice. So we all contribute to the conflict in the DRC because of the mineral that is mined in this particular area. So that's the one thing that I want people, to, uh, what I want to, the listeners to leave with is that we are not innocent. So after listening, hearing me, you cannot be ignorant. Those people who have n never <laughs> exactly. heard of it, they, yes. can be, they can be ignorant. So that's the one thing that I would like to leave listeners with. So how can our listeners... So I'm, I'm, on, 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 I'm on all social media platforms. So on, on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook, I'm Jacob Pluto. You can just get me. Or even if you Google Jacob Pluto, uh, something will pop up. Absolute, and you know, I must say, um, absolutely, it's been such a pleasure, and I, I, and I'm also just more informed on the the conflict, and also just the um, the, the different and unique approaches that you highlight and you illuminate in your uh, dissertation, and I also want to wish you all the best with. Um, your future endeavors, especially with, with the book and also uh, just having to deal with all of the, the admin. We can understand like, uh, uh, what a process it can be, but uh, I look forward to seeing it in hard copy and uh, looking forward to more of your insights. And please do come back to the show. We'd love to hear more about the workshops you may host in the future, especially for, the chil for children as well at schools and any of your other um, future endeavors. And please uh, do remember that uh, you can also be sure to... Um, Watch Better Suit on YouTube and also um, he, and also Jacob is a vlogger as well. You can also be sure to uh, watch The State, which focuses on polit politics and current affairs. And if you are a fan of hip hop, there's a hip hop culture blog as well called Voices of the South. So please do check that out. And on that note, I'm very humbled and honored to have had this conversation with you. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob. Dr. Pluto, we welcome you back to Cape Talk in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for your honest mind.